Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, Mysterious Voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out-of-the-ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a graphic novel that I read. I am back on that graphic novel grind, uh, and today's graphic novel is all about uh, a young Iranian girl's experience growing up during the Islamic Re uh, Revolution in Iran, uh, and her experience uh, going back and forth from Europe. I am referring to Persepolis, which I have the complete uh, edition, part one and part two, uh, by Marjan Satrapi, which was published in 2003 or 2000, 2004, when, when they were finally completed. For those who don't know, Marjan Satrapi is an Iranian French author, uh, and also a cartoonist. She drew a lot of the um, art that you see in this. Uh, uh, that you'll see throughout this video and in this um, this graphic novel. Uh, she's uh, w really well known for Persepolis. It, it, it garnered a lot of acclaim for her and she won a number of awards for it. Uh, she's also written a number of other uh, books and graphic novels and she's gotten some of her work turned into movies. I believe she was the director for uh, the Persepolis uh, film adaptation. Uh, she was also the director of a movie called The Voices, which I had seen a while back. Back. It has Ryan Reynolds, and it's, it's actually a, a pretty interesting take on uh, on a person who has mental illness and is, is killing people, but it's not purely about that person's mental illness or isn't trying to stigmatize that person. Uh, but um, uh, she directed that, which I think is is fascinating. I didn't know, I didn't I didn't know that ahead of time, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a really decent movie, and I, I recommend you go uh, check it out. Um, I think I meant Ryan Reynolds. I might have said Ryan Gosling. Uh, but yeah, she's, she's she's really well noted for writing about you know feminism, writing about Iran. She even presented some of uh, uh, some research and findings to um, to the UN about about Iran and uh, its political uh, or voting discrepancies that, that have taken place there. Uh, and um, she generally talks about her experience growing up there. Uh, pretty fascinating author, one that I didn't know about before, even though that per, even though Persepolis seems to be a uh, a pretty well known book. Uh, it is a banned book, uh, which you know I'm always a fan of talking about those banned books, and I'll talk about that a little later in the video. Um, this is also a uh, Bevan Book Club read from uh, that my friend Bevan, who is a um, doesn't have a YouTube channel yet, but loves uh, talking about books with with me. Um, we, uh, we're reading this for book club this month. If you are interested in joining, click the discord link below, uh, so that you can find out more about that. But without further ado, let's talk about Persepolis. I will do a summary, a little bit of analysis, and we will move on from there. So Persepolis, of course, fo uh, focuses on Marjan as she's recalling her life, uh, from, you know, young adolescence, sort of like her, her, you know, preteen years up until, uh, she became a young woman in her early 20s. Uh, and she notes how she was a young girl during the Islamic Revolution. She finds out that her family was a bunch of revolutionaries or people who were, you know, intellectuals at the time and, and did not like, um, like the religious fu fundamentalism sentiment that was growing, uh, noting that uh, like her great grandfather was um, in line for the throne or worked for the emperor uh, in the 1950s before the Shah overthrew them with the help of the CIA and whatnot. And um, uh, as the Islamist rise up, uh, her parents become more frustrated, especially with the Shah who is trying to stifle freedom of speech and all sorts of things like that. Eventually the Shah leaves, but this allows allows uh, the fundamentalists to, to gain power, including Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who I've talked about before in other videos, interestingly, but he grabs power and immediately starts changing things, um, including um, how women are supposed to dress and what rights certain people have or don't have. Uh, and this, this agitates Mar Marjan's parents, as well as Marjan, who is a bit outspoken, even at, even in a young age. And um, unfortunately, 
Iran um, acts in a way that that strikes up a war with Iraq and Saddam Hussein, uh, which uh, produces a lot of destruction and many of uh, Marjan's family and friends die in in the process. And this brings a lot of refugees into the country, as well as some uh, indoctrination against those refugees and indoctrination uh, uh, towards the government itself by saying, oh, the government did nothing wrong and the people who died were martyrs, they, they fought for the cause, even though they were conscripted and, and sent to war. And many of many of the young men who are sent to war um, uh, tried to get out of the out of the country in some way first. Realizing that the country is growing hostile to Marjan, especially because she's a very outspoken kind of person, they uh, her parents decide to send her to Austria. And she's sad about this. And her mother even collapses when they get to the airport because of how sad it is for her. Uh, and when she goes to Austria, like she has difficulty making friends. She's an outsider, uh, and she doesn't really understand some of the language. She can speak French, but uh, many other people speak German, and it's um, it's a difficult time for her in terms of um, you know understanding people and and getting to know others and and trying to connect with people. But she does manage to make friends with a group of anarchists, although they don't consider her as um, as hardcore or as as legitimate as as them because they they. They follow the teachings of other people that Marjan hasn't really heard of. And in the process, she also starts smoking and drinking and and taking various drugs, including when she um, uh, develops a relationship with a boy named Marcus. Uh, Marcus's mother is very racist towards Marjan, uh, particularly um, noting that she is refugee trash and that she, uh, she should stay away from Marcus. Although Marcus uh, stays in a relationship with her, uh, she later suspects that he was still receiving money from his mother and also cheating on her, which she unfortunately finds out uh, pretty, li- um, uh, pretty far into the relationship. And when she confronts him about this cheating, she discovers that uh, uh, that you know, he, he, he's, he, he doesn't really feel bad about it. And he, in fact, kicks her out of the house and she is homeless. And she wanders around for three months, doesn't really talk to her parents and feels very guilty and tries to uh, deal with this all on her own. Um, eventually, she, um, uh, she makes it back to the, her, um, to her house um, back in Austria, I think it is. And um, she calls her parents who are worried about her and tells them that she wants to return to Iran, but she, she doesn't want to uh, tell them what happened during that three months. Again, it, it seems to be um, a big wait and she doesn't want to let down her parents in, in the process. But when she gets to Iran, she finds that the, the country has become quite different in the time that she's been gone. I think she's been gone around five or so years. Uh, so she is really depressed at this point. She doesn't feel connected to either Europe, where she was, or Iran, where she, uh, where she is, is uh, again. Um, and the fundamentalists have changed quite a bit in terms of making things a bit more restrictive. But once again, uh, Marjan um, is flaunts, flaunts the rules, flaunts the rules, and is outspoken. Eventually, she ends up in a relationship with a young boy named Reza, uh, who seems to be a good match with her, uh, and they even have sex and um, you know have a relationship outside of a marriage, which is. Is frowned upon in that society. They do have to hide it a little bit there. Uh, and uh, Marjan goes to art school with him and is pretty successful. And they, they're even commissioned for some projects, which are ultimately rejected because the city government wants to uh, focus more on the religious side of things rather than the Iranian history or their, their mythology. And uh, she begins to rebel once more. Which puts her at odds with with uh, with the state and the uh, and many of her friends. She does decide to get married to Reza, but uh, she later gets divorced to him, which her father expects was going to happen because uh, you know your first marriage isn't always successful. But also, uh, he suspected that they wanted completely different uh, different things there. Um, and uh, after getting divorced, she decides that she's going to move to France in order to be a little bit more free again because the government is quite. Rest- restrictive towards her. Uh, And as she's leaving, she notes that she gained some freedom, but it was at the cost of of seeing her relatives. As when she leaves the airport, she only saw her grandmother one final time before her grandmother died. Uh, So ending on a bit of a somber note there. In terms of analysis, there is a fair bit to talk about with Persepolis. 
uh, Marjan Satrapi fills it with a lot to think about in terms of, you know, inter in introspection and internalized feelings and also uh, a growing awareness of the fascist state in which you live, or at least the, fu uh, the, the religious fundamentalist state that, that you live. Uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that uh, Satrapi seems to be talking about here is shame or survivor's guilt. I have, I have a difficulty disting distinguishing between the two, so I'm combining them here. But for those who don't know, survivor's guilt is the feeling um, of, of shame, the feeling of sadness, of grief that one feels when one gets away from a traumatic situation and leaves people behind. Uh, you know, it might be the case that if you're a person of color, you know, being able to go to college might leave you with survivor's guilt because you got out of a rough situation sometimes. Uh, and, or like being able to leave a war zone, but leaving someone behind, um, that might produce some, some sort of survivor's guilt or, or shame or, um, feelings of, of, of great depression. Uh, for Marjane, that, that seems to happen to her. Uh, she cannot enjoy her time in Austria or her time in Europe because she is considered an outsider. She doesn't seem to belong and people make her make it known that she doesn't belong either because she doesn't know like the right type of anarchist or the right type of readings among her anarchist friends or her her boyfriend's mother views her as refugee trash. She she's not allowed to feel like she belongs in Austria and Europe. She's she's seen as that perpetual outsider. Uh, but back when, when but when she gets back to Iran, like she no longer feels like she belongs there either, uh, because she like it's become so far gone with the religious fundamentalism that it no longer connects with who Marjan is. She's uh, like she's not that religious fundamentalist. She's, she's someone who was taught to be respectful of others and to be liberated and free because, you know, prior to the, to the Islamic revolution, women enjoyed quite a bit of freedoms. And um, after the Islamic revolution, it became more restrictive. And Marjane is used to those freedoms and doesn't want to give them up. So she no longer feels connected to Iran and no longer feels connected to her parents because they've been through the war with Iraq and Iran They've been through all this trouble and grief and the stress that the the fundamentalist government has produced for them. And so she doesn't really, you know, connect with her parents on that level. Like she loves them and they love her, but they, they've had two different experiences in life. And so Marjan can't connect with, with that anymore. And so she feels um, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, um, based not, not only based on like not being able to connect there, but what happened in... Um, in Europe, in Austria, like she didn't have that great of a time and she wanted to complain, but she knew if she complained to her parents, that would upset them. That would, uh, that'd be kind of admitting like, oh, you tried your very best to give me the best life I could have, but it didn't work. And so I failed you in some way like her. And I think that leads her to do more like risky behavior, leads her to do more drug use and taking all kinds of drugs. They were available to her, but also they allowed her to escape those feelings and um and feel slightly better about where she was in life because if she didn't want to face all of that sadness all of that grief that she was she was going through and so you see uh you see a good job of satrapi noting her own you know uh effects her own like uh, trauma that was building within her um, because she was so far away from her own country. There's a good quote that I would like to read to you from this. I think that I preferred to put myself in serious danger rather than confront my shame. My shame at not having become someone, the shame of not having made my parents proud after all the sacrifices they had made for me, the shame of having become a mediocre nihilist. And you see there the, the, the what uh, Marjan is, is getting at there with her own feelings. Like the shame of letting down her parents, but the shame of letting down herself as well. Like she can't look for comfort really, really anywhere. Uh, and in, in a lot of ways, this reminded me of Beautiful Country by Xian Julie Wang, uh, which I also read for book club. Um, in that, uh, like... Like, Xian doesn't really want to complain to her parents that she doesn't feel welcome in America, that this doesn't feel like home like China did. Uh, and like, she, she can't complain to her parents because she doesn't want to let them down. And because they, they work so hard and they continue to work hard to provide a life for her. And so to say, hey, this sucks. I don't want to be here would devastate her parents and would she be seen as ungrateful in a lot of ways, not only to her parents, but also to herself. And that's that's kind of what Marjan is getting at here and that, that feeling of not wanting to 
be ungrateful for these opportunities that have been given to you in the wake of your parents maybe suffering to make them happen. Another interesting thing that uh, Marjan is tra talking about here is slow creeping authoritarianism. Like Iran's increasing religious fundamentalism was gradual. It did not all happen at once. Uh, like you didn't suddenly it didn't suddenly become impossible for you to throw parties with women or show your hair or anything like that. That took time. And uh, Satrapi is getting at the fact that, you know, this authoritarianism, this this fascism, this uh, this uh, dictator, dictatorial sort of country did not happen overnight. That it all that it that it happened so gradually that you might not be able to fully stop it in time. Like there's the slow loss of rights, the slow restrictions on what women can do, the slow requirements for what men have to do, uh, like the slow buildup of the mythos of this country. Like after um, Iran went to war with Iraq, like everyone who fought in the Iranian wars, uh, like they were seen as martyrs. So you build up this thing of like, oh, you have to give your life for your country, even if these wars are pointless. So you can honor the other martyrs, but also become a martyr yourself because you have to prove how much you, how much you love your country, which is, which is weird. And, you know, uh, like it, it's not fair to the to the citizens within it. And then you also see the slow development of the police state where like at first it's just people ratting on it, on one another, but eventually they create a sort of committee to evaluate whether or not people are actually following these these laws or the, their weird interpretations of um, of their religious documents. Uh, so it's it's not sudden, it happens gradually over time, which is unfortunately something that seems to be happening in in America too. Um, like it's you're you're not going to suddenly wake up and suddenly it's a fascist state. It's going to happen bit by bit, a death by a by a thousand a thousand cuts. It's also not uniform. Like not everyone in a country is going to say yes, we are Islamic and therefore we we love being restrictive in this way. They, also, they wouldn't view it as being restrictive. But like the people are not the government because you see Marjan and her parents and her friends say, hey, this this kind of sucks. We do not like this at all. Uh, we would we would appreciate some more freedom, uh, and the government being. Like absolutely not, and so the when when we often refer to a country as you know religious fundamentalist, or when we say it's authoritarian, it's it's very important to remember that we we're referring to the government and and how they lead the people. It's not so much the people themselves. There might be uh, you know people here and there who approve of what the government is doing, but it's not uniform. It's not no man is an is a nation as I as I think they say, um, which is which is good to remember when you're when you're talking about countries like Iran. We're talking about countries like China, and and just because the government acts a certain way, we shouldn't make assumptions about everyone there. Um, and another thing that's interesting is how this slow creeping authoritarianism uh, is really shows the shadow of of imperialism on, on on the country. Like this was all made possible by the way uh, you, the, you, the United Kingdom and the United States funded coups and and tried to control the Middle East um, at the time, like slowly allowing the the uh, the fascists the the authoritarians to gain power and and control in this way. Like as much as you you can point to Iran's problem and say, hey, this is the problem of them. It's also important to recognize that colonialism, imperialism led to these problems too. And that uh, neocolonialism and, and, and whatnot, those will have similar problems down the road and lead to a whole host of other problems. And so, and so it's important to address these things when you see them. Uh, Marjan also seems to be talking about adolescence and social consciousness. Basically, this is Marjan's story of social awareness in her youth, becoming largely aware of, of the problems that Iran faces, its history, like her own personal family history, and its, its potential and its future, and how what she has to do to make that happen. She has to speak out. She has to uh, say what she believes in her heart whenever possible to avoid going down this uh, religious fundamentalist uh, sort of path that Iran has uh, set up for itself. Uh, and you can see how, like, your beliefs when you're younger and your beliefs when you become an adult are kind of influenced by your parents, your friends, and the changing government. Like, especially at one point, um, Marjan is like, uh, Marjan tries to say, oh, the, the Shah was handpicked by God because that's what she was taught, like, before the revolution. But afterwards, that becomes the wrong thing to say and she got in 
trouble, uh, which is which is fascinating. Like it's a really interesting thing for Marjan to point out that you know, what might be true one point um, might not be true at another point, and that we're really taught these things at a young age, and that although Marjan's like generation might you know rebel against those sorts of things, the generation that was born after the revolution might be more true believers. They might be more inclined to listen to what the religious fundamentalist, the the, the Ayatollah has to say and, and subscribe to that sort of life philosophy. There's a number of other good things here as well, as well as uh, Marjan's um, sort of leaning into feminism and Iranian mythology, uh, including with the title, because Persepolis was the name of the uh, ancient Persian capital, uh, because Iran was once was once Persia. Uh, so she's she's touching a, a little bit on, on that here. So and I feel like there's so much more you could you could talk about as as it um, as it relates to the art and um, uh, the story that uh, Marjan is telling here, uh, as well as you can talk about Marjan's relationship to God and how it changes through the story. Uh, uh, and how it's it's difficult for her to really understand God in the wake of a, a religious a religious fundamentalist sort of nightmare uh, enacting um, <laughs> upon the place where she lives, uh, but ultimately noting how God is a personal feeling to her, like she doesn't feel it the same way that other religious fundamentalists do, and it's unfair of them to try to enforce that sort of mindset onto her as well, uh, which a lot of people respect her for for speaking out about that, and I I I, I am one of them, uh, but there are a couple things that are kind of wonky about this. Uh, like sometimes it feels like this, um, like the messages she's trying to send are just directly to the reader with the characters looking directly at the reader and saying, hey, X, Y, Z. And it feels a little too on the nose. And if you're going to do that, you might as well just write an essay you know, or something like that. Uh, so, but that happens so few throughout the throughout the story that it's not a giant problem. But um, it's always weird when, when a graphic novel does that and just sees it as like someone like looking directly at you rather than interacting with the story. Anyway, so those are my thoughts on Persepolis by Marjan Sustrapi, uh, a really wonderful graphic novel. I'm surprised I haven't heard of it before. Uh, like this is the first time I encountered it, but I am a big fan, uh, probably one of the, the better book club reads that, that Bevan has selected for her book club friends, including me. Uh, and so I do recommend it to you out there if you're in the new, if you're, if you're in the, um, market for a, a high quality graphic novel or perhaps just a story of a of a person's you know coming of age in in a very tumultuous uh time period and it'd, it'd, it'd be worth checking out if you read this before you simply want to comment on something i said here do so below i'd love to have a conversation with you about this otherwise don't forget to like share and subscribe so that more people can find out about this book or this author if they do not already know and again you can join the discord which i've linked to in the comments but until then i wish you the best of luck in your weird and Iranian travels. Farewell.